good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stan Blade. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Alberta. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. It is my pleasure to welcome our special guests and speakers today. They are Richard Brian, Vice President of the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, Bill Flanagan, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Alberta, Dr. Ellen McDonald, Chair of the Department of Renewable Resources within our faculty, and Dr. Robert Froze, the inaugural Chair in Forest Growth and Yield. And to everyone else joining us today, a very warm and at the moment non-snowy welcome uh, here from Edmonton. This is an exciting day for the University of Alberta, the forest industry, and frankly, for anyone who loves forests. It's a major step forward in strengthening this vital industry and the irreplaceable role that trees play in our world. Our faculty has a 50-year history in forestry teaching and research working with a tremendous group of partners. The Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences is a global leader in creating solutions for global challenges in fiber, in agriculture, nutrition, the environment, and human ecology. Our community of incredible donors has been there time and again to support this work. And once again, they have stepped forward in a very big way. It's now my honor to introduce our first speaker, Bill Flanagan is the 14th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Alberta. He was born and raised in Alberta and was most recently Dean of the Faculty of Law at Queen's University. Bill has an extensive record of leadership in post-secondary education and in HIV AIDS research. He is now leading a major program of academic and administrative restructuring at the University of Alberta. At this time, I would like to invite Bill to make our special announcement. Bill, welcome. Great, and thank you, Stan, and welcome everyone. It is my great pleasure today to announce a significant investment that aims to improve the sustainability of Alberta's forest industry. Thanks to a combined gift of $4.1 million from the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Canada, and nine forest industry partners, the University of Alberta has created the Endowed Chair in Forest Growth and Yield. And to Priya and its partners, thank you. Your generosity will ensure that Alberta's forests remain healthy and productive for generations to come. And to Dr. Froze, welcome to Alberta and welcome to the University of Alberta. You bring an incredible wealth of experience in research and teaching and forestry, and we are grateful to have you as part of our community. Alberta may be part of the prairies, but we are also a province of trees. 60% of our land is forested. According to the Alberta Forest Products Association, our forest industry employs around 40,000 people and contributes more than $7 billion to the provincial economy. 70 plus communities rely on the forest industry alone. The benefits of our forests go far beyond financial. Trees replenish both the human spirit and the air we breathe. Alberta would not be the natural paradise we know and love without our forests. Their benefits to the environment are without question as wildlife habitats, producers of oxygen and stores for carbon, among other benefits. And they are also key to Alberta's vibrant recreation and tourism industries. In short, to ensure a bright future for Alberta, we must continue to have healthy, sustainable forests. We know that the forests around the world face many challenges, much of them brought on by climate change. Here in Alberta, the mountain pine beetle has destroyed millions of hectares of forest and continues to pose a serious threat. And this month marks the 10th anniversary of the devastating fires in Slave Lake and the fifth anniversary of the Fort McMurray wildfire. And as we continue to see forest fires burning hotter and earlier every year in Western Canada, so climate change is also changing the shape of the forests themselves as a species of wildlife, plants and trees adjust to rising temperatures. The changes to our forest are enormous and wide ranging. 
but there is hope and there are answers thanks to research. The forest industry is leading the way in Alberta. For more than a quarter of a century, Freya and its industry partners have funded programs and conducted research into areas such as caribou habitat recovery, fire management, reforestation, pest management, and water and soil protection. The chair in forest growth and yield will take this work to the next level. A dedicated research position housed right here at the University of Alberta will allow us to generate Alberta growing solutions to these pressing problems. Dr. Froze's research will be solution focused, helping our province's forest industry to be more financially and environmentally sustainable. His work will inform the development of policies and regulations that support these goals. His work will also prepare the next generation of forest management professionals who will fill urgent vacancies in the industry. For more than 100 years, the University of Alberta has moved great ideas forward, transforming them into discoveries and innovations for the benefit of society. These advances have helped build social, cultural, and economic prosperity for our province and helped us secure our place on the world stage. Forestry is one of the pillars of our economy and its continued success is vital. A healthy forest industry demands healthy and sustainable forests. And this requires long-term generational thinking and solutions. Our forestry program recently celebrated 50 years and a long history of partnerships with the forest industry. And today's announcement is another step in that relationship and will position Alberta as an innovation leader in forestry. So once again, to Freya and your industry partners, thank you for your investment and your generosity. Thank you for joining us in partners in innovation and together we will build a bright future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, President Flanagan. Such an incredible gift and one that would not have been possible without the direct contribution of the members of the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta. On behalf of our faculty, thank you for your generosity and for your commitment to the future. I will be hosting a Q&A at the end of uh, this session. So if you are starting to think about questions that you might have for Dr. Froze, start to conceive of them, you can put them in the chat box uh, or you can uh, put up your hand later in this uh, uh, presentation for uh, your question to come forward to Dr. Froze. I would now like to welcome Richard Brian, Vice President of the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta to say a few words. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Blade. I'd like to start with some background uh, about the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, FRIA, and our relationship with the University of Alberta. FRIA is an independent industry-based funding organization aimed at supporting projects and initiatives that improve the forest resources of Alberta and then enhance the management of Alberta's forest resources. FRIA is at the center of a long-standing, strong relationship between industry, government, academia, and the consulting workforce. We promote collaboration and strive to ensure that projects and initiatives related to forestry improvement are innovative and inclusive. The faculty of ALS has been an integral part of FRIA's efforts to channel funding towards projects aimed at developing new knowledge, testing new approaches and methodologies, and building innovative solutions to complex resource management problems. The relationship between ALES and FRIA in this regard goes as far back as FRIA's creation in 1997, the point at which the organization accepted the responsibility for delivering the FRIP program. Not only does ALES lead and participate in specific projects, the forward-thinking leaders at ALES are helping FRIA develop uh, ideas to deliver on a strategy in the context of current issues. In addition, the forest industry and forestry consulting specialists have long valued their relationships with the professors, graduate students, undergraduate students, and other partners as we collectively tackle challenges associated with forest management. So why did Freya and his members have an interest in establishing a research chair in growth and yield? As uh, President Flanagan just mentioned, sustainability is, it really is the cornerstone of forestry in Alberta and Canada. In order to manage for sustainable forests in perpetuity, we need to know how they grow. Natural fire origin stands and post-harvest managed stands grow in different ways and do not respond in the same way to treatments. 
we need to understand these responses to manage our forests effectively. That's what forestry professionals have been taught for decades across Canada. But the questions are getting more and more sophisticated now. We need to understand how the changing climate will impact the growth and composition of our forests. How can we use new technology like LIDAR to become more efficient and accurate in assessing forest growth and yield? We have lots of great data and interested professionals with a passion to pursue the answers to these questions in, in right across Alberta. And most importantly, we need highly trained graduates to have an interest in studying this and supporting the forest sector. We were seeing the pool of new graduates shrinking across Canada while our needs and questions were increasing. So Dr. Froze, you've got your work cut out for you and we really look forward to working with you. At this time, I'd like to recognize the companies and thank the companies that provided their support for the creation of the endowed chair in forest growth and yield. They are Alberta Pacific Forest Industries, Canadian Forest Products Limited, the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, Mercer International Limited, Miller Western Forest Products, Norboard Inc., Northlands Forest Products, Vanderwell Contractors, West Fraser Mills, and Warehouser Company. So I now have the privilege of introducing Dr. Ellen McDonald. Dr. McDonald is a professor of forest ecology and the chair of the Department of Renewable Resources. For the past 30 years, Ellen's research has been focused on the ecology of Northern forests, particularly forest regeneration, stand dynamics, understory plant communities, and the relationships among these. She has endeavored to learn from forest responses to natural disturbance and how to apply these to improve management and restoration of forests. She has published over 150 referee journal articles and supervised 41 master students and 15 PhD students to completion. As an applied researcher, she greatly values partnerships with industry and government, which helps to ensure that research results are applied to, to practice and policy. Ellen has been research, uh, recognized for research excellence by receiving scientific achievement awards from both the Canadian Institute of Forestry and the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. In 2019, she received the University Cup, the University of Alberta's highest honor for excellence in research, teaching and service. In addition, Ellen has demonstrated true leadership and advocacy in discussions with FRIA and its members uh, and members of the forestry, forest sector in Alberta about the establishment of the Chair in Growth and Yield. It is due to her vision, dedication, and commitment that we are gathered here today. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellen McDonald. Over to you, Ellen. Thanks, Richard, for those kind words. I'm just so excited to be here today. Uh, this, this is indeed a really great day, a very exciting moment for the university and also for Alberta's forests. Uh, this really demonstrates what can be achieved when people work together towards a shared goal. Uh, this gift from FRIA and its member companies speaks to the kind of leading edge thinking that's emblematic of our province's forest industry. For the past 25 years, uh, Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta has played a pivotal role in building links between government, industry, communities, and researchers like those we have here at the University of Alberta. This type of collaboration is absolutely vital. It's only by working together across these sectors that we can address the challenges that are facing our forests. That is how we can manage them in a way that sustains their ecological and social, social values while ensuring that the forest industry continues to thrive. The endowed chair in forest growth and yield is grounded in this spirit of collaboration. Uh, solutions will be developed and tested right here in our province. The work will be generational in scope. We're going to create knowledge to inform policy and regulation and develop best practices for sustainable forest management. This chair will help place Alberta at the leading edge of forest research and education, attracting and training those young professionals that the forest industry needs to remain vital in the future. I'm extremely pleased to introduce our inaugural chair in forest growth and yield, Dr. Robert Froze. Dr. Froze holds a BSc and an MSc in forestry from the University of British Columbia, and he then went on and earned his PhD in forestry, wildlife and range sciences from the University of Idaho. He has worked as a professor at Michigan Technological University since 2003. For the past three years, he's been director of the university's forest field research facility and area, which is called the Ford Center and Forest. 
We are very pleased and proud to welcome him back to Canada, where his role at the University of Alberta will begin on June 1st. So, uh, Robert, welcome. We're so excited you're joining us. I'd like to pass it over to you to say a few words now. Thank you, uh, Dr. McDonald, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you as well, President Flanagan, Dean Blade, and thank you, Rich Brand, for your words on the purpose and impact of the overall effort here. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank all of the folks who are attending this event for your time and for your interest. I have to start by saying I'm profoundly flattered to be chosen as the first endowed chair in forest growth and yield at the University of Alberta and to become a member of the School of Forestry. I know the university is a highly regarded institution and the home of leading edge research, outstanding teaching and learning. I know so many graduates of the university hold important positions in industry in consulting and in government. And so I find myself uh, about to be surrounded by so many talented and accomplished people with a record of contributions in forestry that I will have a tough time living up to. It will not be easy. Uh, it will not. Equally important, I think, is the tremendous vision shown by FRIA, by the Forest Growth Organization of Western Canada, and by the member companies that brought this endowment into being. Uh, these organizations and companies recognize that Growth and yield research and education is vital to supporting Alberta's forests and associated industry and our natural resources. And I think there are many worthy and compelling research needs today. Some of those involve really bright, shiny technologies or charismatic animals. And there are many important needs at the university and in the service of science and society. And with all of this said, these folks decided they needed to support forest growth and yield. I think this is, uh, because of the recognition of forest growth and yield as a cornerstone of sustainable forestry. So in sustainable forestry, we don't harvest trees without a careful and defensible plan on how they'll be replaced. But it's not just reforestation that matters when thinking about sustainability. It's also the rate and the timing of the flow of wood from the forest, which in turn supports the forest sector, provides jobs and supports rural economies. But it's not just meeting the needs of people now. It's also about meeting the needs of future generations. It's not just about the needs of people. Growth and yield is the cornerstone of planning for sustainability of a wide variety of ecosystem services provided by managed forests. And those include clean water, healthy soils, wildlife habitat, and the conservation of biological diversity. And so I see a professor of forest growth and yield needing to interact with a wide variety of disciplines and many highly trained resource specialists all in the service of long-term sustainability uh, of the many essential values that flow from forests. And with all this said, you chose me to be the first faculty member to fill this important endowed position. And so I am, and I mean this most sincerely, tremendously flattered. At the same time, I'm also tremendously excited about the opportunity to be part of what I see as a very committed and collaborative environment for applied research in the service of industry, uh, industry, society, and sustainability. This is actually what attracted me to the position and to the university and to the province. So since I told my colleagues in Michigan that I was leaving, many of them have commented to me that they understand how I'd like to return to my home country and be closer to family. And honestly, that's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm really looking forward to being back in Canada. But what really attracted me to this position is the opportunity to be in Alberta, to be at the University of Alberta, and to work with the people and the companies and the organizations that had the vision to create this endowed position funded in perpetuity in forest growth and yield. And for that, I really must again thank you for the wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. So during interviews for faculty positions, the candidates are always asked to outline their vision for a research program once they're hired by the university. I'd like to speak a little about my plans for the future. Uh, first, I want to note that the priority for the chair in growth and yield, as I see it, is to engage with industry and the broader community to understand the issues they face, to interpret those conversations, and to translate what I learn into a research program at the university that addresses those issues in a meaningful way. And I'm fortunate those conversations have already started. I was on a conference call yesterday for several hours. And again, I think this shows just how constructive and collaborative the environment is in Alberta. 
but I still have a lot to learn. And so one of my first activities when I arrive is to get on the road to see much more of Alberta than I've already seen and to do that off pavement in the woods to meet with people, to listen, to learn and to reflect. And of course, to do all of this while socially distant. Let's hope that doesn't go much longer. I was asked a little while ago about my plans for when I first arrived in Alberta. And I said something to the effect that I wanted to reacquaint myself with my old friends, Lodgepole Pine and White Spruce. I was thinking about this yesterday and I realized I'd left out another good friend, which is Trembling Aspen. I think I might have taken that old friend for granted in part because Aspen is an important tree species in the forests I'm leaving behind in the Great Lakes region. And I've been really fortunate to lead some interesting research on productivity and soil sustainability of intensive management of Aspen in Michigan that was funded by the forest industry here. But Aspen is so much more important in Alberta than it is in Michigan. And here too, I have much to learn. And so in my first road trip, I'll be meeting with companies and people and visiting places across the mixed wood and deciduous forest regions as well to learn about their unique and particular needs and to develop ideas for research that span all of the forest types in the region. So I think if growth and yield is a cornerstone of sustainable forest management, then a cornerstone of growth and yield is forest inventory. A forest inventory sounds like a pretty dry area if you don't know it already. It sounds like counting things in the back room of a warehouse. But in forestry, it's so much more than that. Inventory is about what is out there, in what form it is, what condition, and how it's changing with time and response to disturbances, and both those disturbances that come through management and those through natural processes like fire and wind and insects and disease. Uh, growth and yield is literally about the change in forest inventory in time and in response to disturbance. And there's so much exciting, interesting, and important, important work that's been done and needs to be done in growth and yield. So core growth and yield tools are models. And when I say models, I mean things as simple as single mathematical equations that are used to calculate the volume of wood inside of a tree or something as complicated as a sophisticated computer simulator that takes into account climate and ecology, soils, history and disturbance to project how trees and stands of trees grow and die and uh, regenerate. And these tools are used every day by foresters to develop plans and to develop prescriptions, but they're also used for teaching about silviculture and forest development and growth and yield and as research tools. Models can be thought of as hypotheses about how trees and stands actually work in the real world, and they can be tested and refined to learn more about the world. And so a consistent theme in my research has been forest models at different scales. There's a rich history of modeling in Western Canada, and I hope to bring some new perspectives to further push the envelope in this important area. Uh, in the conversations that I've had so far, there's clear interest in more work on how models can incorporate the effects of climate. And this is not just to make models that are able of capturing the potential effects of climate change, but also to make models more powerful at capturing existing range of climates so that they make predictions that are more precise. There's also an interest in a broader strategy of integrating models into evaluations of carbon storage and emission, especially as public debate continues on exactly how carbon pricing or markets might be constructed in ways that protect public interest and support industry and regional economies. Uh, moreover, in my discussions, I sense a great interest in uh, at least understanding diversifying kinds of silviculture practiced in Alberta, including alternative ways of ensuring healthy and robust regeneration and enhanced forest management techniques that increase the value of forest harvesting that in turn strengthens the diversity and sustainability of forest practices on the ground. So to do this thoughtfully and with confidence requires to improve models that can forecast outcomes from new approaches. The, the thing I feel is that good models bring confidence to our forecasts of the future and enhance our ability to demonstrate that commitment, which is essential to protecting the public interest in the management of what are intrinsically public forests. So, a little earlier, I poked a little fun at researchers that like to study bright and shiny things. And I'd like to talk just briefly about emerging applications in technology in forest growth and yield. 
So remote sensing is literally changing everything. We've actually been using remote sensing for a long time in forestry through the use of aerial photography and interpretation of those aerial photographs. And that's been a critical tool. Uh, Satellite-based remote sensing gave us the ability to examine forests at scales of entire provinces to countries or even the globe and update those inventories frequently, capturing changes that occur slowly through growth or quickly through fire and other large disturbances. What's revolutionizing forestry now is remote sensing using airplanes, helicopters, and even compact drones. So we can now mount a LIDAR sensor on a $1,000 drone and collect a three-dimensional profile of the canopy of a forest stand in a single day if we want to. Might take a little longer to analyze the data, but the potential is enormous, both in what new things we can do with these data to assess, monitor, and model our forests, but also in the savings in time and cost that may be possible by shifting our data collection from ground to air or collecting more data from the air than we could ever hope to collect on the ground. A challenge though, is that we don't yet know enough about how we can make efficient use of the tidal wave of data that we can now generate in forests. It's not inexpensive to acquire LIDAR based and enhanced forest industry uh, inventories, though the cost is coming down fast. I mean, some uses are obvious because these can replace more tedious or expensive work that might've been done with aerial imagery and can augment these uh, products with, with additional and new and interesting data. But other uses are not so clear, and there is a significant challenge in interfacing existing forest models that are designed to work well with ground data with the data that we can collect from remote sensing. I think a particularly exciting new application is the development of handheld LiDAR sensors and 3D camera-based approaches for collecting detailed data on forest structure, including measurements of entire individual trees from the ground. I'd argue that this is the most cutting edge area in research and forest inventory at the moment. Applications of terrestrial sensors include automation, potentially of harvesting machinery. I think we're all amazed by self-driving cars from Tesla, but imagine self-driving feller bunchers, or at least imagine a feller buncher that's been augmented with LIDAR sensors, GPS units that capture data on harvested volumes and site conditions, relay that data real time to the mill and to the silviculture foresters who can then use those to optimize reforestation treatments and prescriptions at the site level. So things are moving really fast in this area and there's tremendous opportunity. I hope to focus a substantial effort on remote sensing applications and growth and yield and to ensure that we build capacity in Alberta, both at the university and in industry, in consulting and in government by conducting research and training undergraduate and graduate students in these emerging technologies. So I'd like to conclude by making a few comments about what I see as a synergy between research activities that address timber and those related to environmental values and other ecosystem services. So in my mind, these are not separate concerns. Doing a good job protecting the public interest in healthy forests and in healthy forest economies is expensive, but it's a necessary expense and a lesson I've learned in the Midwestern United States is that keeping forests as forests is a tough job. When forests become more valuable for uses other than forestry, they tend to get lost or converted to those other uses. It may sound like a poor example when thinking about the vast area of public forest in Alberta, but there are many interrelated and competing demands on forests, even in Alberta where forests seem endless. The ability to assess and to predict how our forests change in response to these demands is absolutely vital. And I think the investment in an endowed position in growth and yield is particularly visionary uh, because it'll ensure for perpetuity the attention to this critical area. And so in conclusion, I must thank you again, as I am so flattered and so excited to be the first person at the University of Alberta to fill this important role. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Froze. Uh, your research and teaching expertise is an incredible addition to our faculty, and we're grateful to welcome you back home to Canada. Uh, I know that you're going to do really important work uh, in the years to come.
our guests have been watching us today. Some of them have actually already submitted questions, but I would also encourage people if they do want to put uh, questions in the, the, uh, the chat box. Um, and I see that we already have a hand. So uh, Cynthia Strassen, uh, please go ahead. Hi, Robert, and welcome to the University of Alberta. I was wondering if you could comment on what opportunities you see with liaising. That looks amazing with the screen behind you. You just like moved to me. What opportunities do you see for liaising with the great work in adjoining provinces who of course share the boreal forest that we have and there's some great stuff happening right. in see. Well, I think the first and easy answer is, you know, so much of the original initiative in creating this chair came from the Forest Growth Organization of Western Canada. And so FGRO has members that span the Western provinces and who are interested and in, committed in collaborative research and uh, in sharing ideas, thoughts and activities towards a community or a communal benefit. Uh, within the region. I already, we've, you know, I'm, I'm having to, be, of course, become reacquainted with all of the activities that are going on in Canada, but I have good colleagues that are working at the Canadian Forest Service in Victoria. I'm learning about initiatives at, um, at working on uh, climate uh, sensitive forest models that span the region and lots and just lots of energy and enthusiasm and collaborative efforts and working across other regions. So I think the opportunity is tremendous there. You know, of course, the boreal forest doesn't stop at the border with Saskatchewan or at the border with British Columbia. You know, there's many similarities and, and challenges that span the region. So also I've, I have history and experience from British Columbia where I was born and raised. And so I, I think there's just tremendous opportunity. I really look forward to taking advantage of those connections in the position. Thanks very much for the question and great answer. A question has come in around graduate students and I, I've noticed that a number of our students have joined us this afternoon. You And thank you, uh, Robert, for mentioning uh, the role of undergrads and graduate students. What do you look for, especially in a graduate student and, and how do you see graduate students contributing to your program? You know, as, as much as uh, research is kind of the, you know the the core a core descriptor of a of a faculty member at a at a major research university like the University of Alberta, uh, engaging and training graduate students and uh, you know creating the next generation uh, of academics and resource professionals I think is absolutely intrinsic to the position and it's been without a doubt um, the most rewarding one of the most rewarding. No, I think it may actually be the most rewarding part of my career in academia so far going back 18 years. And I should actually add, I've managed to convert a hydrologist to, to a growth yield person, a silviculturist to a growth yield person. So I'm pretty good at that. And I look forward to continuing that when I'm at the University of Alberta. Uh, those folks then go on to take leadership positions elsewhere. And it, it, you know, it's, it's clearly evident from the, the spectrum of graduates of the University of Alberta's forestry programs that are currently engaged in industry consulting and government and how important that role can be. So I, I think graduate students are absolutely intrinsic. What do I look for in graduate students? I have had graduate students from Nepal and uh, from Canada, from the United States. I've had graduate students with wide diversity of interests. And when you have someone connect with you that has a passion for what they're doing and wants to make a difference, it just it makes the experience uh, so tremendously rewarding. My, some of my former students have gone on to academic positions, some work in industry, some work in, uh, in consulting. I look for people who are engaged and, and curious and who want to make a difference. And then I look for ways to help them reach whatever potential it is that, that they're hoping to accomplish. And many times they discover that along the way. So that's one of the big rewarding parts of the journey. Thanks very much. And thanks to Vashti Dunham for asking a, a very similar question around graduate students. We, we might come back to that, uh, but there's a, a great question from Richard Brian that, that is asking of the work that you've done in the US, mm -hmm. what are the sorts of things that you see that you might be able to move into uh, a Western Canadian perspective? I think there, there's kind of a ripe opportunity in globally really for some unification of some principles and forest modeling. You know, I've had an interest for a long time in making models sort of climate sensitive and that's not necessarily climate change sensitive, climate sensitive, because it was the, the next step in making models more sensitive to tree growing conditions, generally speaking. And there have been quite a few efforts to, to, to do that over the last decade. I don't yet see a consensus that's emerged. And so there's some really fantastic work that was done by the US Forest Service at developing a climate sensitive version of the forest vegetation simulator. That's actually been kind of 
stagnant for a little while. So I, th I think some of the ideas and passions around that I can bring to Canada that, that I'm really looking forward to doing when I'm in Alberta. The other aspect is you know, the significant amount of methods development and remote sensing assisted forest inventories that's taken place in the United States within the forest inventory and analysis program has been a gift, I think, uh, globally, although there's tremendous work, it's also been done in Canada uh, and at, in uh, Scandinavia. And so I, I hope to draw from some of that wealth, wealth of knowledge and find new ways to integrate that into the modeling angle. Those are kind of two specific examples I think I can bring from the US. There's one last thing that I'd mentioned that's been kind of fascinating to explain over the years, which is the, the very nature of land ownership changes the way we think about growth and yield. You know, I'd like to really compliment Canada in a sense because our strong public land base changes the way we think about what sustainability, long-term sustainability means and the role of forests in society. And so I look forward to returning to that environment and, and exploring kind of what that means for growth and yield again in, in my research program. Thanks very much. Uh, we're drawing to a close. I really appreciate the questions that have come in. Uh, and uh, I can see that people are certainly uh, welcoming you in. Maybe we'll just try to cover this last question. I'm just going to try to do a power read on this. Um, a question around forest wildlife and birds uh, uh, with respect to inventory and mapping. Um, I, you, you've already made a little bit of comment with respect to biodiversity mm -hmm. and, and animals in the forest landscape. but. Uh, in, any thoughts on how to connect that wildlife piece uh, to uh, forest management practices and other activities? You know, I mean, of course, doing some reading on Alberta, and I know what an influence corridors have on wildlife, particularly some wildlife species of great concern. The way I like to teach it to forestry students, and I feel sometimes forestry students need to be uh, encouraged to think about the forest as, as more than just the trees, but wildlife habitat in forested regions flows from forest structure. And what silviculturists do, what foresters do, is manipulate forest structure. What growth and yield is about is forecasting the response of manipulations or the response of forest structure to manipulations. So I think the more that we can capture forest dynamics in response to manipulations, whether it's to for, for, uh, forecast the amount of timber volume we produce or just for the interest of forest development, we have the ability to connect better with folks that are managing wildlife habitat for species of concern or species of a particular uh, resource value to people, even if it's just wildlife viewing. So I, I think the connection there is really very important and forest growth and yield has a lot that it can contribute. Thank you very much. Uh, so this ends uh, our, our formal uh, activities today. Uh, just, of course, thank you, Robert, and, and thank you to all of you for joining us uh, and, and thank you to our speakers as well. Just again, to express my gratitude once more to our generous donors, the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, and the companies that have directed their contributions to this new research chair. It's an exciting day for us. Thank you for joining us. And this concludes today's announcement. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.